system is a word that is sometimes used, quite often in America, sometimes here, um, but it's very often used and misused and even trivialized. Oh, that's awesome. But we're not really talking about something that's, that causes us to wonder or, or be in awe. Uh, we could be talking about just about anything that is vaguely positive. But there are some things that are awesome. There are some sights that are awesome. You see a mountain range. Perhaps you're flying over the, the Andes or the Alps or whatever it is. Or, or, or you're going up walking in Snowdonia and it takes your breath away and you think, this is awesome. Or, or you see a sunset and there is a wonder about it. And if you were to use the sort of language of awesome, you might even say, oh, that, that is awesome. Because it fills you with awe, it takes your breath away. In fact, sometimes human beings can be awesome. Perhaps a piece of art, or a piece of music, a voice, or, or a feat of ability, or engineering, or, or sport, or some sort of stage acting, you think, that was awesome. It took my breath away. And of course, all of these things ultimately point us to the awesome God who made all things that we see and gave human beings their ability. Why are there awesome things in this world? Because there is an awesome God. And most awesome of all, is what took place the first Christmas. And so for a few moments this morning on this Christmas day, I want to take us back to think about how awesome it was and what happened there on that Christmas day. But not just that, but for also for us to wonder at the response to it and, and indeed at the response to it still today. So first of all, as we uh, consider this together, would you turn with me again, if you've got a Bible, to John's Gospel? And we're going to consider those verses, just verse 6 to verse 13. And the first thing that I want us to see is the wonder of the Saviour revealed. Uh, I'll try and only say this once. Do stay with me and see this, uh, and may the Lord speak to us and help us this morning as we consider these things. All truth that leads to salvation comes by revelation. That is to say that if we are to know God in a saving way, if we're to be saved by God's truth, then we're never going to get there by working things out for ourselves. You and I cannot reach up to God and, and work it out and save ourselves. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 says this, He, that's God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, our hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. In other words, we know that there is a God. God has put eternity in here. We know that there is something more than, than what we see with our eyes, than the physical world. We know there is a God. But in and of ourselves, we don't have the ability to know him personally. We can't work him out. We don't know who he is. We can't find out who he is and what he's done on our own. The only way that we can know him and find out what he has done is if he, Almighty God, takes the initiative and reveals himself to us. And this is what we see throughout the pages of Scripture, throughout the pages of the Bible. From start to finish, the Bible is a book of revelation. That is that God reveals himself to us in the pages of the Bible. And so if you turn to the first page of the Bible, you don't have to do it now, but, but if you were to, you would find in the beginning, God. The revelation that there is a God. 
And it doesn't stop there because it tells us how we got here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is good news. Here is revelation of a good God and a creator God. And so every story and promise and prophecy and rule and record and genealogy and letter and gospel and poem and psalm that is in this wonderful book made up of 66 books all serves to teach us who God is and how he deals with sinners like us. What a wonderful book this is. Talking to my hairdresser and trying to convince him to read it. He's like, oh, I don't get it. Oh, it's all about stories. Isn't it wonderful that God gives us stories to reveal himself to us? But this revelation, this book, came through ordinary people. And, and so people right throughout history, as God has spoken to them, they have given us the revelation of God and it has been written down for our good. But right at the heart of revelation, right at the center of what God has revealed to us that we might know him, is Jesus himself. And the person who was given the great responsibility, the great privilege of pointing to Jesus was a man called John. And we read about him in verse 6. There was a man called John, a, a man who appeared, and his job was to be a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. And have a look at verse 7. Why was he to be a faithful witness to Jesus Christ? So that all through him might believe. What a wonderful job John had. To preach so that all who heard him would believe. And this is the job of every true preacher. Their job, like John's, is to make things clear that are in God's word. It's not my job or Mark's job or any preacher's job, Philip's job, to make things up or to show how clever they are, which in present circumstances would be a very difficult thing to do. It, it, it's not ours to impress upon other people what we think is they need to hear. No, our job is to preach and teach what God has revealed to us. And so John came saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What a wonderful message. That is true today. Jesus Christ came into our world. John saw him. There he is. Behold, there he is. And Jesus Christ has come into our world. He has lived. He has died. He has risen again. He is now ascended to the right hand of the Father, one day coming back. And it is my God-given job to stand here before you this morning on Christmas morning and say, Behold, by faith, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But in these verses, Jesus is not described as the Lamb of God, but as a light. And that is good news in our world of darkness. Three times in verse 6 to 8, we read the title of light. And then in verse 9, we're told that he is, have a look at it, the true light, which gives light to every man. And, and this true light, which gives light to every man, was coming into the world. And indeed, he came. This is the wonder of Christmas. That the God who is sent his true light into our world of darkness. Isn't that wonderful this morning? If we were to really grasp it and comprehend it, this would fill us with awe. That God sent his true light into the world. <coughs> That's what inspired the hymn writer to write. He came down to earth from heaven, who is God and Lord of all. But why did he do it? Well, he did it out of love because spiritual life and light cannot be found in and of ourselves. One writer says this, 
The light that penetrates the spiritual darkness of a world in rebellion against God does not dawn from within. There's no light in here that can answer the problems that we face in our world or even indeed the problems that we face in here. No, it comes from without, from God himself. Jesus Christ is the true light that enlightens everyone. We can't possibly plumb the depths of all that that means. But I can tell you it means this, that there is no other light that will save you apart from this light. That he is the one true light which each and every one of us needs if we are to know God personally. If we're to be saved from the darkness in us and in the world that we are a part of. That's why Jesus later said, consider these words, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Here's a question for you this morning. Have you got that light or are you still in the darkness? That's the wonder of Christmas. But wonder though it is, there is a great sadness that we see in these verses, and I want to highlight it to you briefly uh, before we come to the second great wonder. And it's this, it's the, same, it's the sadness of a saviour rejected. Every culture has its own way of, of accepting dignitaries and, and uh, people as they come. As, as a dignitary or a leader or a state head comes to the country, uh, different ways of celebrating are used. A red carpet is put out or flowers are put round uh, the neck or, or people dance and sing and, and make music. And, and we all have our ways of showing honour. But how would the world respond to a visitor from heaven? John tells us in the starkest terms, verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. You know, there was no red carpet out when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords arrived. Instead, the world neither recognized him nor even wanted him. Yes, there was ones here and there. There was an Anna here and there was a Simeon there and there was some shepherds and a few wise men. But in the main, he was unknown and he was unwanted. And worse still, he came to his own, verse 11, and his own didn't want him. They didn't receive him. The very nation that had received the prophecies of his coming, which is what we read about throughout the Old Testament, all of the books of the Bible that lead up to the New Testament point forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were given to the Israelite people, and when he came, they didn't want to know. Rejected him. Herod wanted to be told where he was as a baby. You remember the story, the first Herod. But it wasn't because he wanted to worship him, it was because he wanted to put him to death, and so he put the children to death. The religious leaders of his day, or well, they were there, remember when the man was lowered down through the roof and he healed them, who was there in the midst? It was the religious leaders, they were all watching at the front, but they were murmuring, and they brought their questions to him, not because they wanted to know, but because they wanted to catch him out. And even the common people who followed him and loved to hear him, the majority did so because of what they could get out of him. No, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. In fact, it's put in the starkest of terms again in Isaiah 53, verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. Now listen to this. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Why we? Surely this is talking about the Israelites. Why we? Because we are no different from those who lived in Jesus' day. And John's description of how Jesus was rejected 
is an indictment on us all. Sin has so darkened our understanding and so alienated us from the life of God and so blinded us to the truth that none of us are able to receive the light of Jesus in a way that will truly honour him. Here is the wonder of all wonders and our eyes are closed and our ears are shut and you may be sitting here on this Christmas morning and that is how you're sitting. Our problem is aptly described in verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness. Praise God for light that shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. And light and darkness dwell together. When you light a candle, the darkness flees away. The darkness cannot comprehend it. And as human beings, we're in the dark. In fact, the scriptures go as far as to say that we are dead in trespasses and sins. That is, that we're dead spiritually. We are cut off from the life of God. As we've already seen, we know that there is something more. We, we know deep down that there is God. There is eternity in our hearts. But though God's light has shone out in the person of Jesus Christ, we can't comprehend it. We hear of his birth, and we're not interested. We hear of his death, and we don't care. We hear of his ascension up to heaven, and we're just not that bothered. <coughs> what a sadness this is, that the God of light and love has come, and he has brought light into our dark world and to our dark lives, and we don't want to know. I've lost count of the amount of times that people have said to me, with all of the injustice and sadness in our world, why doesn't God do something? And you know what the true answer to that question is? He has, you just don't want to know. Now people are in sadness and people are heartbroken. And they are asking questions, and those questions do need to be answered. But friends, light has dawned, and our hearts are closed to it. As human beings, we're in the dark. And it's our willful rejection of God's light and truth that condemns us to death and to hell. This is a great sadness. But finally, I want us to see... The wonder of the Saviour received. You know, some of the best words, some of the best news, I should say, in all the Bible hinges on the smallest of words. And we've got one of those words here. Look at verse 12. But. B-U-T. Small word, great hinge, huge door. But. But what? Verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. There it is. Isn't that good news this morning? Wonderful good news. Here by this three-letter word we are opened into and given the hope of God, that we won't be left in the darkness of our own rebellion against him, that he won't treat us as our sins deserve, but he will provide a way of escape, and not just a way of escape, but a way of adoption into his family, because for all who will believe in his name, God graciously holds out the right, the privilege to become his children. What is this saying? John is saying that God offers adoption papers to all who will believe. That they are signed and they're sealed and they're approved and they are offered freely. Be my child. I will be your father. Believe. 
and so he makes enemies his children. To those of us who are his enemies, God offers the opportunity to become his children. And that's all of us this morning. And all of this is on account of who Christ is and what he has done. If we simply trust in Christ, stay with this, instead of relying on ourselves, instead of looking to our own resources, if we simply trust on Christ and on his merits and on what he has done, then God will receive us. And then what will we know? We will know the blessing of the Lord that makes rich. We'll know him blessing us and keeping us and making his face to shine upon us. We, you, I, can know pardon, that is forgiveness, for all of the past and in the present and even for the future. Complete pardon. And as well as that, peace, the peace that comes from forgiveness in our own hearts. Isn't it true that we can be so anxious and our minds can be so racing and we can feel so unanchored and we can feel as if we just don't know where we're going and what we're doing? But in Christ, stay with it. There is peace. And not even just that, but God's presence in this life and then hope for all eternity. This is wonderfully good news. And all through simply believing. However, if you've been following John's argument, and if you've stayed with me, then we know that this poses us a problem. Because whilst all of this is available if we believe, by nature you and I are so opposed to God and his truth that we're not going to believe. We're still in the dark. We don't want to believe. We don't see our need to believe. But whilst this is the case, it is not the end of the story as far as God and the gospel are concerned. And this is the real wonder of salvation. That whilst we cannot reach out to him, he reaches down to us. Those who receive the grace of adoption receive it because they have also received the grace of the new birth. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus? You cannot see the kingdom of God unless what? Unless you are born again. In other words, you cannot receive this salvation unless you're first born from above unless you have spiritual life to see it. Those who believe only believe because they're born of God, verse 13. It's not of human will or a natural birth. It only comes from God. So what is the good news of the gospel then, if this is true, that, that our salvation depends on God? Why is this good news? Well, here is the good news. It's that God not only shows us the door into his household, but he picks us up and carries us through the threshold. It's God that saves. What we can never do by ourselves, namely recognize who Jesus is and trust in him, God enables us to do by his grace. How does he do it? By showing us that we are sinners. <coughs> Have you seen it this morning? The presents, they've come and they'll probably come after um, this service. The turkey, whatever else it is you'd like to have, that's great. Concentrate your mind on this. Have you seen this morning that you are a sinner? Not just that you, nobody's perfect, but I am a sinner. And I'm a sinner in the eyes of a holy God. I'm in the dark and I need his light. Because for those who are born again, that's the second thing that God shows us. He 
He shows us our need of Christ. I know I need him. I know I cannot save myself. I know that even though God sees me as a sinner, and even though his wrath is over me, he's provided an answer, and my only answer, and the true answer, and God's answer, <laughs> is Christ. And if I am to be saved, then I need to turn to him. And boy, do I feel my need. I'm not who other people think I am. I've even fallen short of my own standard, let alone God's. But here I am in the dark, and God has sent his light in the coming of Jesus Christ, and I need him. Is that you this morning? <laughs> then what do you do? Believe. And I encourage you, go to the scriptures and see Christ, but don't stop there. Go to Christ and find salvation. For there is salvation in no other name under heaven than in this name. And as you believe in him, he will save you. May the Lord bless us this Christmas with the wonder of Christ come down and the wonder of salvation come in.